Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 15th, 2015, and this is the Week in Charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, well, we got a bit of a snag. I went to grab a Mountain Dew, and there weren't any. My daughter had a sleepover this weekend and a slumber party, and that, that explains why they were up all night. They, they found my Mountain Dew stash. So um, I don't know what I'm going to do for energy today. Maybe I'll just have to... Get excited. Uh, there's this famous screen. If you've been trading for more than a day, you probably know you could lose money trading. Or, as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's why I so often temper everyone's expectations when it comes to the markets. But if you take your time and you work hard, you might just be pleasantly surprised. Provided, of course, you pay attention to things you should. Okay, uh, do me a favor, throw me a bone. You read the book, you like the book, put me up a review on Amazon. Uh, quite often there's more people here than on reviews, so somebody's holding out on me. One of the reasons I ask is because there are a few malignant people out there who review their reviews, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. How can you review a book if you didn't read the book, but you're reviewing the reviews? Anyway. I can't wrap my head around that. It makes, it makes my head hurt. What are we going to talk about? Well, I've been spending a lot of time lately wrapping up an article for Traders Magazine. And it looks like it's going to make the cover uh, of the German version and then the English version in the following month. So I was pretty excited about it. I wrote about efficiency. What I, efficiency and, more importantly, inefficiency are very important market topics. And when I write about them, I kind of feel like it's not that exciting, and I feel like sometimes it's like blah, blah, blah. But I was surprised when they came back and said, wow, this is great stuff. We want you on the cover. So it made me realize that I think it's important, and I was worried that other people might not find it exciting enough because most of the time people are only interested in setups. But they need to understand there's a lot more to a market than just set up. So we're going to talk a lot about efficiency and more importantly inefficiency and that's going to make a lot more sense in a few minutes. Now keep in mind that in a stock selection course we spent a considerable amount of time on efficiency and inefficient markets and I'm going to kind of wrap that up in a nutshell in the next 20-30 uh, minutes. So we'll go kind of fast and get through it. But you should have a good idea what's going on. Uh, I want to follow up on the IPO bull market of 2014 uh, we just kind of a brief update of a couple of um, winners that are still working. Uh, so far, the IPO bull market is not dead yet. We had a few um, troughs, as you know, in, in 2014, but so far, so good in the IPOs. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. I was speaking at a conference for money managers, and it was only money managers that were in attendance. And, of course, I talked about stocks. And when I got through speaking, to my amazement, and it shows you how, uh, you know, one of the things they tell you in, in speech class is that you want to know your audience. But one thing that I didn't realize, I just assumed, but I didn't know, is that I just, I assumed that there were some stock traders in the audience. But when I got done speaking, I quickly found out that no one in the audience was trading stocks as a money manager. And I found this shocking. And it got it got me thinking. It's like, well, if you can't beat them, join them type of thing, you know. And it's like, well, I can beat them, uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to join them. So this, this made me think that, well, wait a minute. This is actually going to increase inefficiencies in the market. So let's talk about that. I think that the stock picker has become... A dying breed. In fact, when I uh, I was asked, I was approached recently by a major publisher, and they said, "Hey, uh, you have a book you'd like to put out?" And I'm like, "Well, matter of fact, I do. Uh, I'm about 70% uh, done or thereabouts, which means I've got another 70% to do. If you've ever written a book, or another 90% to do. But anyway, Ed." I basically uh, in in the uh, preface that I sent him, I said the stocks the, the person who could pick stocks is a dying breed. 
And they came back and said, yeah, we agree. So we're not going to publish that book because the, there, there doesn't seem to be an interest in that. So I'm actually going to put that, that in the book. I'll tell that story in there. And I think that's important that we are a dying breed, but here's the good news. The sovereign call of exchange-traded funds and other derivatives have drawn traders away from individual stocks. So the stock picker, again, is a dying breed. And now this gravitation toward these derivative products increases inefficiencies in stocks. And this is especially true with the smaller cap issues. So should the prior trend continue, the stock picker will be met with amazing success. You're going to be playing in a less crowded playing field and you're going to be able to exploit these inefficiencies as more and more are created. So this should get you excited if you're willing to do a little homework, sift through some stocks, go in that treasure hunt daily looking for those inefficient stocks. Now, let's talk a little bit about efficient market hypothesis. And these people are academic, and they've never made a dime other than selling maybe a paper or two. <laughs> from their academia uh, standpoint. Efficient market hypothesis states that everything is priced into the market. So you're foolish to think you could beat the market. And they are right to some extent when it comes to very efficient stock. And their theory comes apart with less efficient stock, with stocks. You can have a solar company with the promise of solving the world's energy crisis doubles over a few days or runs up over 600% over a year or so, uh, as we saw last year with one. Uh, a biotech with the promise of curing some sort of horror disease can make a similar move. These markets are not efficient, okay? The large potential moves are not priced in. Now, let's take a look at this Cala Biosciences. And this recently uh, broke out and rallied about 200%. Now, you're probably thinking, breakout? I thought Dave trade, traded pullbacks. Well, in IPOs, there are certain breakout characteristics that patterns I should say that do work quite well in more established and I dare I say more efficient stocks breakouts don't really work that well and I would strongly urge you not to do them. but in IPOs there are certain breakout patterns that do work quite well and I do trade them so Calabaya Sciences it breaks out and it rallies about 200 percent over like three or four days so that is not an efficient market. Everything was not priced into that market. Some new informa information flew into the market, or uh, came into the market, I should say, and then the stock flew based on that information. There was something new, some sort of catalyst made it take off, whereas a more efficient stock, it's like everything seems to be known for the most part, and they tend to just chop around. Now, it doesn't have to be a new technological revelation that will solve the world's problems. It might be movie delivery or even comfortable exercise clothes for people like Big Dave. Or it might be movie delivery, burritos, or comfortable exercise clothes for people like Big Dave who have eaten too many burritos. So these smaller yet-to-be-discovered companies are more inefficient. So as you can see with Cala, newer issues, which uh, in other words IPOs, also tend to be inefficient. The reason I have exercise clothes in there is because one of my favorite examples and I can probably go dig out the service for you if you want to watch it, uh, that service for that day. It's in the archives of the service. There was a beautiful setup in the uh, Lulumon, Lulu. And I made fun of the company because they made yoga clothes, and they were a fairly new issue at the time. And they had a textbook setup, and it was absolutely perfect in the setup. And I made fun of it, and it went up about 40% over the next few days. And it, it really woke me up to the fact that I should not confuse the issue with facts when it comes to stocks. So something could be a fad uh, in, in an IPO and then take off, or a fad in a regular stock, uh, an established issue, and take off. It doesn't necessarily have to be some kind of technological revelation is my point. Okay. And again, IPOs tend to be more inefficient. Now, this is kind of a summary slide of, of quite a bit of a lecture, and let's just kind of wrap it up as quickly as we can, or, or cover it as quickly as we can. A large cap stock tends to be more efficient, okay? It becomes a crowded playing field. Um, there's a lot of 
analysts, and these analysts are out trying to justify their jobs. So they're coming out with some kind of report on the company, and then some other analyst is trying to justify his his job, and he might come out with a report that's uh, that's quite different. They're not following these little small stocks. They tend to follow these bigger cap stocks. Now, a bigger cap stock has a bigger capitalization. The company itself is bigger. The volume is usually much higher in these stocks. So you have a lot of players. They're probably in a lot of funds or most funds out there. Uh, they might be in major indices. So these are well-known names. The more well-known a name, the more likely it is to be an efficient stock. For instance, Coke and Pepsi are probably going to chop around a lot more and not go anywhere a lot more than Sky People fruit juice, which you probably never heard of. And I've never heard of them either until I did some research years ago on efficiency. And I was like, oh, okay, well, Coke and Pepsi would be good efficient stock examples. What would be an inefficient stock within that same sector? I am missing my Mountain Dew. So the more known a company is, obviously the more efficient it is. The more unknown it is, the more inefficient it can be. And smaller cap stocks in general tend to be inefficient too. So if something like the Cala is discovered, it can make a very large inefficient move. Now, volatility is also a good gauge of efficiency. If the volatility of a stock is in line with the underlying or representative index of that stock or the overall market, if you want to look at it that way, then that stock tends to be very efficient. Okay, right now S&P or spiders, whatever you want to look at, we've got an HV of about 13. So if you're looking at a stock that has an HV of about 13, it means it's right in line with the market. And by the way, you're not going to beat a market with stocks that are less volatile than the market. Okay, you you need to be in stocks that have demonstrated they can move more than the market in the past historically, which means they have the capability of making similar moves in the future. So know the personality of the stock and know the volatility of the stock. Now let's take a quick look at a stock that made a volatile move. Now this is a relatively new issue or it's pretty much an IPO for um, our purposes. And you can see, and it might be hard to see because there's a little trading back here, but it did run up about a hundred percent. Okay. Now the scaling is doesn't look it doesn't look that impressive because We've had this big run over here, okay? This big run over here messes up the scaling a little bit. But this is a substantial move. If you back all this out, this chart looks a little bit more vertical than it does here. So we had a nice little pullback in an IPO. And we look at the historical volatility, and it's in the mid-70s on this particular stock. That's a fairly high historical volatility. That's roughly, a little bit less, but roughly six times the overall market, okay? So we know that this stock, it's going up about 100%. So we know it has a potential to move. That's, that's an inefficient type of move, okay? It was $25 um, a month or so ago, and now it's 50 bucks. okay? What's changed since then? Well, in a big, efficient stock, probably nothing or nothing that makes a big deal okay and then notice that the stock goes on to double then go straight up and never goes you rarely get them to go straight up but it goes on to double and so far so good I saw it was a little weak this morning so I might be putting a jinx on it but you can see that it has made a significant move in the past it has a significant volatility six times the overall market round numbers so this is a stock that has the potential to continue to make a large move. Now, by the way, before I forget, 
Finding inefficient stocks is just one piece of the puzzle. And we spent, uh, I think, 14 hours total in the stock selection course. So first, that's just one little piece. And it's a very crucial piece. you got to find this Kite Pharmaceuticals or you got to find this Kala IPO type of stocks or a little solar stock like Sun Power, SPWR. That's only one piece of the puzzle. The second or the other pieces of the puzzle are selecting the proper stock. So your stock selection starts with finding an inefficient market. And then you need some structure to work around. Now, we talked about that structure in addition to a setup. But we talked about that structure, as I just said, for about 14 hours. So you do need something like an acceleration. Some of that structure could be like an acceleration of trend. And then, of course, like your pullback, which would be your setup. In this particular case, it's going to be kind of hard to mark it out here, but you can see that this market did have an acceleration of trend before it pulled back and then set up. Okay, So we had some structure to work around in this inefficient market. Now, keep in mind, you can have too much of a good thing. So in the case of this Cala, it triggered here, it ran up several hundred percent over several days. Well, let's take a look at what the volatility did. Well, the volatility skyrocketed from below 100 to like 150. So now this stock is so volatile, it's too volatile to trade. So it went from 35 down to 17. So it halved over a few days, and now it's kind of up. And it looks like it might just kind of bounce around in here. It could be dangerous, very dangerous to trade because you've had such a huge spike in the volatility it's such a huge move. So you can always have too much of a good thing when it comes to markets. As a general statement, though, lower volatilities are less likely to move than higher volatility stocks. Higher volatility stocks are more likely to move than lower volatility stocks, and they tend to be more inefficient. The only caveat is you want to give them a little bit of room with the volatility to make sure they have some volatility to expand. If you're trading properly, you're going to capture two things. One, an expansion in price, and two, an expansion in volatility. The price is going to go in the intended direction that you are hoping, and it's going to do it on an expansion of range. So you're not only going to get on a trend, you're going to have that trend accelerate while you're in it, and that's a beautiful thing. If you jump into a higher price, I'm sorry, a higher volatility stock like we just got burnt on UEC, doesn't always work that way, but in this case, it did work. We got an uranium stock. The volatility was through the roof, and it already made that expansion of volatility. It didn't work out. Okay, It happens. So as a general statement, you want to make sure you do have some volatility to work with or the stock has demonstrated that it can it expand from a high volatility situation to an even higher volatility situation. And finally, the less fundamentals you have, the more inefficient a stock is going to be. Uh, just for S&Gs, I looked up that Cala, which just went up like 300%. I looked it up on Yahoo Finance, and it lost $3 a share in 2014. So it has no appreciable fundamentals. And a better way of saying that is it has no quantifiable fundamentals. Okay. So if you look at a company like McDonald's, they're making hamburgers. You know what their competition is. You know what the price of beef is. Okay. You know you have a pretty good idea what their margins are. And there's a lot of other factors that go into it. Now, I haven't put a McDonald's chart in a while because it's lowered volatility. It doesn't pop up even when I'm doing my tradable universe. It's so far down there, I don't even bother looking at it because it's so low in volatility. So I don't know what's happened lately. Uh, keep in mind that that inefficient that I'm sorry, efficient markets and big cap stocks like a McDonald's can occasionally trend. Like Walmart went sideways for like 17 years, and now it's it has moved in more recent times. So we're going to talk about that in just one second. Inefficient markets can still move. My point is, your big opportunities are going to be more in these inefficient issues. The little biotech that could go up 100% over several days, or in the case of like Kite, over 100% over several months. Still, 
that's a very inefficient move. So the more quantifiable the fundamentals are, the more in line that stock will trade, or I should say, yeah, the more value it can be placed on the stock. Now keep in mind that bull market sentiment or bear market sentiment can change that. So if you have a very efficient stock, like an IBM or something like that, and we get into a serious bear market where it drops, the overall market drops 50%, well, then, then IBM will make an inefficient move and it will lose 50% of its value. Uh, sometimes a stock, now keep in mind this is a moving target when it comes to efficiency. Sometimes efficient stocks can become inefficient and vice versa. Okay, now let's take a look at that. So let's say you have a stock that rallies up and all of a sudden it becomes a well-known stock and it's way up here and people know it, okay? And then let's say some, it begins to set up and then all of a sudden it starts selling off and there's some bad news that comes into the market and it does this, okay? Well, this is what I call, this would be what I call a go-go-nobo. You take a very efficient stock or a stock that has become very efficient and well-watched and well-analyzed and over-scrutinized and put it under a microscope, something like a GMCR, okay? And it's a very efficient stock, but even though it's an efficient stock, when it begins to roll over, it can make a very inefficient type of move. And this is what I call the go go Nobo. Now, let's say, like, a great example was uh, of this was we had a solar stock, SPWR, which went up and up and up and up and up to extremely high levels, and then it fell from grace, and then it bottomed out forever, okay? So, Inefficiency can be a moving target. A company could fall from grace and then reinvent itself, okay? So maybe during this period of time when this stock based sideways for a long, long time, the stock got their act together, okay? Maybe changed the business model up a little bit, maybe perfected the technology, and the promise of the future, which we love to trade in the IPOs. We don't, we don't care about the reality. Okay, it would be nice if there is a little reality, but nine times out of ten there isn't, okay? So we don't care about the reality because we know there's probably not going to be any. We're trading that promise of the future. In fact, that's why I put that in the title of my IPO course. It's the promise of the future. We're, we're capitalizing on the promise of the future. Whether or not that materializes, we don't know, and that's why we have money management. But these solo stocks were hot several years ago. They died out, and then in 2013, they became hot again, okay? So they became, at some point, they probably became more and more efficient, and then people were looking at them and realized that there was no promise there, and then they actually became a stock that made an inefficient move. So the fall from grace, that's a go-go domo, and then the rising from the ashes is the Phoenix strategy. Okay, and, and, and both of these strategies revolve around emerging trend patterns such as first thrust or bow tie type of patterns. Okay, so keep in mind that efficiency can be a moving target. Okay, now one way to help understand inefficient markets is to understand efficient markets. So at ETFs, your lower volatility stocks tend to cancel out your higher volatility stocks. So even though you might have some really hot stocks within an ETF, you're going to have some more efficient type of stocks that are going to kind of water down the overall ETF. Now, if you're, if you're in an ETF, like I like GDXJ right now, um, if, you're in a GD, if you're in a GDXJ, which is mostly – Volatile stocks, it, it can still be an inefficient type of market. But as a general statement, ETFs are going to be a lot more efficient than individual issues. And 
this is why I think that the stock picker has an unbelievable opportunity over the, I hate to say how many years, but let's just say over the next 10 years. Because, again, we are a dying breed. And the fund managers are, are, are out there, you know, God bless them, but they're out there trading the ETFs for a variety of reasons, okay? And it, it's a lot easier to justify an ETF. You don't have to explain why you own this little, why did you, why did you buy that crazy uranium stock, okay, that went down and stopped you out? You're not going to be put under that kind of microscope if you if you bought the banks and the banks start going down. Well, you know, it looked like the banks were going up. Easy to explain. Hard to explain why you bought a particular stock that imploded. Okay. Now they don't clients. <laughs> they're not going to rush to to pat you on the back for the stocks they take off, but they will put you in the microscope for the ones that don't. So it's it's much easier to just just trade an ETF and not worry about it, okay? Um, an ETF is also not going to make a huge, not going to get sliced in half overnight like the potential individual stock might. But so what? We get paid to take risks. You know that's going to happen sooner or later. You're going to get whacked on the stock, but through proper money management, maybe a little damage control, you'll be able to survive to fight another day. And then maybe in between these occasional whackings. You'll make 100, 200, 300, or even four, or five, or 600 percent on a stock. Uh, indices are even worse. In fact, the broader base of the more stocks that the index, the worse. Instead of diversification, it's really diversification because you're going to have more and more stocks kind of watering things down. Commodities are obviously an efficient market. An example that I used in the article was that. I have to wake up at 5.30 every morning because if I'm going to get any writing done like the article that I was writing or the book I'm working on or any other project, slides or whatever for my upcoming trip to Italy, things like that, I know I'm going to have to get up long before the market and long before most of my clients. So 5.30 seems to be the number I've settled upon. I don't want to get up at 5.30 every morning, trust me. So I make myself a big old cup of coffee, and it's actually more than a cup, more like a pot. Um, so I'm a consumer. Now, somebody had to grow that coffee, so there's a grower. And somebody had to roast it or process it, so there's a processor. So the consumer could put some demand into the market. The producers and the processors, they need to lock in a price, so they might buy forward. So that might cap the forward price of stocks or puts a demand into the markets. The growers might sell forward. So that puts supply into the market. So maybe that'll cap the demand, I should say. So those two might wash each other out. There could be a discrepancy between the two. And speculators will come in and try to capitalize on the discrepancy. And then a hedge fund might think that the near crop is worth more the crop further out, so they might put a spread on. I might they might sell one crop and buy the further out. So all this puts supply and demand on the market. Some other hedge fund might feel just the opposite and do just the opposite, put like the opposite spread on, or maybe take the opposite side of the trade. Who knows? The point is it's a crowded playing field. Okay. Forex multi trillion dollar market. You've got banks in there, you've got governments in there, you've got large corporations, not to mention hedge funds and George Soros and um, little one-lotters and, and little mini one-lotters and, and um, everybody that the Forex market gets pushed onto as a way to riches, the, um, the retail crowd, okay? Now, this is not to say that you can't trade Forex and you can't trade commodities. I was a commodity trading advisor for 14 years, so I learned a little bit in that process. I was actually registered as a CTA. And one of the things that I learned, especially as I learned more and more about inefficient markets, such as stocks, is that in the commodities, 
or any other efficient market like Forex, you got to pick your spots carefully. And one of the best things you could do is play a emerging trend pattern off of life of contract lows, multi-year lows, ideally all-time lows, okay, if you got them. And then look for some sort of like a bow tie pattern or something like this. So this is the aforementioned coffee. And you can see we've got to buy. It didn't kind of take off right away, but it didn't do anything wrong. And it certainly did go on to make new lows after this emerging trend pattern. Not that it won't always work, but when it works, it could work big. And this, as you can see in this particular case, coffee went up about 100%, okay, or doubled in value. That's a very inefficient move in an efficient market. But your best trades come off of those trades with, that are coming off of major, major lows. And the reason is the most amount of people are on the wrong side of the market. All your leftover trend followers are on the wrong side of the market. Oil is going to be is going to make an inefficient move higher. I guess it's already made an inefficient move lower, but it will make an inefficient move higher. I don't know exactly when, sometimes in 2015, probably. We need to keep an eye out for bow ties and first thrust there. Let's take a look at a currency. Now, you've seen me. I showed, like, the, the all-time top in the euro versus the dollar back about five years ago. It was pretty cool. Set up as a nice bow tie. Had a bit of a double top look to it. But even if you look at the more recent slide in the euro versus the dollar. You could see that it made a multi-year high and then it made a bow tie afterwards and then we had a sell signal right after that. So I would pay attention to the euro versus the dollar. Not today, not tomorrow, maybe not next week, maybe not next month, but at some point, sometimes in the future, maybe we'll go to par. You know, maybe we'll hopefully go to par between now and when I get to Bologna. So the Euros so my dollar is worth more when I go to do some currency trading in the local markets, okay? But when this currency pair makes a bow tie or a first thrust or whatever other emerging pattern it may make off of major, major, major lows, okay, it could make a very inefficient move. Now, the point I'm trying to make is you have to pick your spots carefully. You might wait around for years before you get an opportunity like this in coffee. You may wait around for years until you get an opportunity like this in Forex. But that's okay, because in the meantime, we're, we're ferreting out little IPOs and, and little solar stocks that have fallen from grace that used to be $80 a share and now $5 a share, and then all of a sudden solar comes back in and they take off. So we're looking for that type of inefficient move, and that every now and then, one of these efficient markets, such as Forex, such as commodities, can set up. All right, I have pontificated here for some time, 30 minutes or so. Uh, any questions on efficient versus inefficient markets before we shift gears? Okay, good, quite a bunch today. All right, the great 2014 IPO bull market is not dead yet. This has been an ongoing, this is kind of like a dead money report. This has been an ongoing theme, and I'm pretty excited about that. In fact, if you look at the open portfolio, you'll see that we do have some IPOs in here. In fact, most of these are IPOs, and the Kite has been um, pretty good stock today notwithstanding. As you can see, up about 100%. By the way, somebody was asking me earlier, people get caught up in percent correct. I would rather make money than have a high percent correct. Uh, and, and by the way, if somebody does claim to have a 90% a correct system, uh, it's an, don't get too excited about the 90%. What you need to worry about is that 10%, okay? If in those 10% trades there's a the potential for you to blow up, and lose all of your money, then it doesn't do you any good to be that accurate, okay? And find out what you're making on those 90% correct trades. I'd rather have a couple of big outliers in the portfolio and make a lot of money than, be, than have a high percent correct, okay? 
But you can see that we've already taken profits on this one. That's an IPO. And this one is nicely profitable. Okay. And again, you can look at this number down here and see that this number is a pretty big number based on the entire portfolio. And the rest are kind of mediocre. Okay. And then uh, this is also an IPO too. So we've got a lot of IPOs that have set up recently in the service that uh, look like they have uh, potential. Ruby too, I think. So we're playing an IPO trend now in the service. Uh, we're not going after some of those thinner issues, which uh, you can do on an individual basis. It's a little bit harder for me to put something like that into the service because a little bit uh, you can't have a bunch of people rushing in all at once on those smaller issues. But that doesn't mean that you can't personally trade them. So IPO market's still alive and well. Uh, we got a BAB pattern and one of them recently, so I wanted to point that out to you. Uh, this just shows you that, the, again, it's alive and well, and it's pretty much doubled since this, uh, this BAB pattern. This is a recent example uh, triggering uh, late last year. So that's kind of cool uh, on that. The other thing I'm noticing is everything we talked about in the course is still playing out. A lot of IPOs are coming public way up here and then going down, and some IPOs like this one are coming public at lower levels, and then going up. So, so far, so good. A lot of things are playing out. As I said, quite a bit. They either fly or they die. And the good thing is, in a lot of the die situations, you could just completely avoid them by waiting for a setup and not trying to rush in and trade them too early. you got to let them trade for at least one week, okay, and then go in. Uh, kite still flying so far so good on this one and you can see that triggered here again didn't really take off right away but with a little patience uh, it has taken off nicely and so far so good on that one uh, any questions on IPOs any questions on efficiency anything we've covered so far okay and um, any any other questions it could be on any subject if you want before we get to the um, actual stock charts okay all right we'll get to that Robert uh, somebody quit the service last week or week before and we, we talked about this said it wasn't active enough well here's the thing the beauty of it is I looked at the market recently and a few nights ago I caught myself saying you know what I'm glad there aren't any setups because the market has done this over the past several months in fact since late October on a net net basis, which we're going to look at in just one second, okay, the market hasn't done anything. So I'm glad that I listened to my database, and I'm glad I didn't put on a whole bunch of new positions and only took those positions that were the best of the best. So far, so good. Knock on wood. They worked out pretty well. So if you're worried about action, make sure you are also, or first and foremost, looking to make money. And this is the hard part of trading. I would rather have somebody tell me to not do anything when the market's doing that. And that was a hard lesson I learned years ago. I went to a conference down in New Orleans back when they had the tag conferences, and I had printed money for a while. I thought I was geni a genius. And then all of a sudden, I started losing money. And it's like, what's wrong with me? I'm losing it. I'm not that smart. Maybe this trading thing is not going to work out. What am I going to do? I'm depressed. I'm bummed out. So I started pouring my heart out to one attendee. And he looked at me, and he's like, you plotted the S&P lately? I'm like, well, I plot it every day. It's a stupid question. He goes, well, you haven't. He kind of scratched his head, looked at me kind of sideways. He's like, well, you haven't noticed it. Hadn't gone anywhere in three months. It's like, well, shoot. That's right about the time I started losing money when this thing started going sideways. So had I paid attention to what's really going on, I would have seen that the market is going sideways. So I don't necessarily need someone to help me when the market's going up. I could figure that out. And I don't really need somebody to help me when the market's going down. I could figure that out too. So... What I need is someone to tell me when not to trade, and that is vitally important. How many times do I have to tell you I do a show every Thursday at 10 o'clock? Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs>
So yes. And that's the secret to trading. And secret to trading is, is staying out of bad conditions, missing missing the bad conditions. If you if you avoid bad conditions, all that is left is good conditions. So don't do anything unless there's something to do. And make sure that something to do is something that you think is going to be really great. Great trades don't come along every day. And even in short to intermediate term trading, it still takes time. And sometimes it's six to eight months and occasionally longer to catch those big cycles. I used to get really stressed out if I didn't perform well over, let's say, six to eight months. I still get stressed out. I'm not going to lie to you. I still get angry and uh, a little bummed out. But now I realize that, hey, it's all part of what I'm doing, and sometimes it does take a little while to catch that trend. So if it's going sideways, market's going sideways, I'm going to still do my homework every night, but I know that that might be a good time to work on some projects, pay attention to some loved ones, maybe get in a little bit extra, extra, uh, a little bit extra exercise. Okay. Um, this morning, I, while I was writing my column, Livermore has a quote about um, how when the market is chopping around, the people that are in there every day that are that are that are buying and selling while this market is churning along or laying the base for your found laying the foundation or making the base for your next move. And he's basically saying let let them fight it out. Something I'm always saying, let them fight it out. And uh this morning I went to find that quote and the first thing I opened the uh when I flipped through my book, the first thing that came up was this Livermore quote, which I thought was a sign and this is why I put it in the column this morning. I let the craving for excitement get the better of my judgment. The desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among professionals who feel that they must take, some, take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. What I'm seeing now in the professionals that should know better is I'm seeing a lot, a lot of top picking out there. I'm seeing a lot, a lot of bearishness. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't look great, okay? But I think it's a little too early to sell the form, give up, and turn totally bearish. It's okay to nibble a little bit on one side of the market or the other, but don't bet the form, don't labor yourself, don't paint yourself into the corner, all these things that I'm always preaching about. All right, we've got some good questions coming in. I had to beg for them today. All right, I appreciate it. Let's see what we got. Okay, Robert, we'll get to that when we get to the charts. Okay, uh, Greg says, you take multiple trades in the same sector? Yes. Or limit for diversification? Yes. Okay, we do both. Um, I'll take up to two, occasionally maybe a little bit more in one sector. Now, keep in mind that every time we take a position, I view it as two halves of a position, a trending loaf and a trading loaf. And if you get a chance, go in and watch the archives of these shows, especially where I talk about making that transition from a swing trader, that short-term trader, to the longer-term trader through the money management, through the taking of the partial profits. So let's say we have a position at ABC, okay? Well, I see that as, as two loaves or a half and a half, okay? So a half plus a half is what? A whole equals one position total. And let's say this is a biotech, okay? Now let's say I like this um, um, CDE, and it's also a biotech, okay? So we've got a half and a half, okay? So this is another bio. So now I have two biotechs on. Now, when I see that third, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, when I see this third, I need to think long and hard. Do I really want to put in three biotechs would only have two to portfolio? Well, maybe the good news is with time, I take partial profits on this one, and I take partial profits on this one, so now a half plus a half equals one full position, and now I have room for, yes, another biotech stock. 
Okay, so up to two full positions. Sometimes I might push that a little bit because let's say that I do get this one in here. Now we got two full positions, and let's say this one is a profit target. Now we're down to one half. So now total I have one and a half positions on. Okay, and if those positions, if I'm trailing a stop higher on those positions, if I get stopped out, it'll be at a profit. Okay, now my exposure is still high, but at least I'm, I'm trailing that stop higher and getting a profit. So I will be willing to push the envelope a little bit. Okay. Historical volatility, ATR question mark. My software doesn't have it. What software do you have, Scott? Maybe I can get you the indicator. Historical volatility is statistical volatility, and it's uh, based on statistics, which we all know when it comes to the markets are worthless. 73% of all people know that. But it does give you a statistical representation of what a market has done and what that market is likely or possible, could possibly do, okay? Average true range is a measurement of the range of a market, and it, it factors in gaps, and it can be useful. In fact, a lot of people point out, people ask me, Dave, you said your stops with average true range. I'm like, yes, but I don't actually plot it on my chart. I eyeball the range. And I make sure that my stop is outside of that shorter term volatility. Statistical volatility is a linear, what do you call that, a natural logarithm change or something. And the statistics, which I wouldn't get too wrapped up in, again, because they're pretty much worthless. But it's a bell curve kind of thing. And, you know, don't quote me on this because I'll show you quickly how little I know about math. I don't know a lot about electricity either. I know a little bit about it. But I could still flip a light switch and get light. So if all things constant in the markets, what they, aren't, what they aren't, let's say you have a stock with HV of 20, there's a two-thirds chance, which is a statistical bell curve thing, or 0.66 something chance that that market will be 20% higher or 20% lower a year from now. So it's annualized measurement. So like earlier, you saw the stock jumped up to 150%. So that stock's either going to be 150% lower, which obviously would be zero, which would be impossible, 150% higher a year from now, all things constant based on that volatility. Again, don't get too caught up in that. Just know that if it has a higher reading the overall market, it's more volatile, more inefficient. If it has a lower reading than the overall market, then it's more efficient. Okay? Wow, a lot of um, a lot of questions. What's the difference between HV and beta values? Nothing. You could you could use I don't know how they calculate beta, but you could use you could use HV as a measurement of beta, and that's what I do. To those who don't know, beta is how much a stock moves relative to the overall market. So you could you could use the words beta and HV or volatility, whatever. Maybe beta and volatility would be two word two ways to to look at it. You could use the words beta and volatility interchangeably. I like to trade high beta stocks. You could also substitute the word volatility. I like to trade high volatility stocks, however you want to look at it. Oh, okay, John. I, I have that code somewhere, and you can find it online. It's Software's Trade Station. That's easy. That's a little. That's a small uh, – that's only a few lines of code. Yeah, Google it on the Internet because here's the thing. My computer with Trade Station on it is in the closet, and by the time I dig it out – and get you the formula, um, a lot of other things will happen before then. <laughs> so probably do some honeydews or something that my wife is looking for. So, yeah, you could probably Google it uh, and find it quicker. If you have my first book, uh, Dave Landry on Swing Trading, I think the formula, maybe even for trade stations, in the back of that. Okay. Yeah, I have it for Meta. In fact, for Metastock, I actually I had it, and then I upgraded my Metastock, and somehow I lost it. And I actually had to poke around the Internet yesterday to get it for the HV that you just showed earlier. But I do have it for Metastock. I do have it for um, Telechart. Okay. Historical volatility trade station is volatility standard deviation. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, Greg, but if you do, I'll take your word on it. So 
take a look at uh, volatility standard, standard deviation. If you want to compare your numbers to mine, you can. Some say to play the shorter time frame if larger time frame is sideways. I'm not comfortable trading intraday thoughts. Don't trade intraday, okay? Here's the deal. Even if you're day trading, if the market is chopping around, it's going to be harder to make money, okay? The best time to, to I'm not, I'm not going to say day trade. I would tell you not to day trade. But the best time to day trade is when the market's trending. So you can be working within that trend. Okay, I don't want to get too complex and occasionally a counter trend move uh, within that. But your trades are going to be a lot better. You're going to make a lot more money day trading if that underlying market is at a trend and not choppy itself. So don't 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 feel the pressure to start day trading because the market gets choppy because that's the absolute worst time to day trade, okay? Yeah, you're welcome, Howard. I just saved you a lot of money, so send me a check for half that amount. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, here's one of the quotes, too. Um, best quote for Livermore. After spending many years in Wall Street and after making and making and losing millions of dollars, I want to tell you this. It was never my thinking that made the big money for me. It was always the setting. Got that my setting tight. And a lot of people have confused that quote with writing out big winners, which I'm a big fan of. Don't get me wrong, okay? You want that 100% move that I just showed you and something like kite, even though it seems like it just goes up every day today, notwithstanding. You still have to sit around and wait for it to happen. Now, a lot of people confuse that Livermore quote with him saying that you want to sit on your winners. And, and you know, that may be some, that might be true. But that particular quote there is saying that you make money by waiting, by waiting for your opportunities. So by not grinding it out during that sideways market is what he's saying there. By beating the market, I assume you mean gain or lose as much as the market index, for instance, S&P 500. What about swing trading where you get in and out of swings? That's what I do. Can efficient stocks beat the market by swing trading? Ah, uh, geez, I don't know. The, the problem with that is you're risking too much. I, I hear what you're saying. Like, so you're saying, like, okay, well, maybe if we could, we could time the individual efficient stocks right, can we beat the market? Um, I'm going to say yes if you're in a nice trending market. I had a client who, for whatever reason, instead of trading the more volatile stocks, decided that he was going to go off on his own and trade the less volatile stocks. And he did really well until he discovered the fact that just because something isn't lower in volatility, just because something is lower in volatility doesn't mean that it can still have adverse moves. And if you are trading something efficient, you're going to have to trade more shares in order to compensate for the lack of movement. So if you go in... A uh, couple of uh, webcasts to go check them out. It might be they might this one might be on uh, YouTube. Every now and then I feel gracious and I throw out a show on YouTube. I might throw this show. This show might be on YouTube too. Um, but I did a whole presentation on volatile versus lower volatile stocks and which one is actually more volatile trade. And it's going to surprise you that in reality, that less volatile stock is going to be more dangerous to trade. Because you have to put on more shares to compensate, so I don't, I don't, we don't have to limit ourselves. We're individual traders. Damn it, we could do whatever we want, can't we? We don't have to trade these big cap stocks because we work for this company, and this company only trades big cap stocks. So we're stuck trading big cap stocks, and we're thinking like, okay, well, which you make a good point. Uh, how are we going to beat the market with the stocks that don't tr move more than the market? Well, what if we time the individual stocks through swing trading? Yeah, I, I, the answer to your question, yes, that may be possible. But why handcuff yourself to such a small, difficult strategy when if you poke around enough, 
you could find some of these occasional, occasionally they're a little elusive, but you can find some of these occasional big winners that I often point out in these chart shows. Heather says, by comparing the stocks, beta comparing the stocks movement versus the market index volatility compared to stocks movement versus the old price history. Correct. Very good answer. So, yeah, historical volatility, you're looking at, you're looking at the stock at this point in time, and you're looking at what its volatility was where? Historically, okay? So this is a measurement of itself, but if you take that measurement, let's say that measurement's 50, and another one's 100, well, comparing these two is beta, okay? Compared it to the overall market, let's say the market's 13, you know, comparing these to that is beta. So, yeah, volatility compares its movement to itself, and then when you compare those numbers, then it becomes beta. So, yeah, different way of looking at it, but that uh, makes sense. Well said, Heather. Heather's on the service, of course. My people on the service tend to be a little bit smarter. Just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Shay says, can you talk about taking triggers after missing the first trigger? Yeah, uh, Shay, we've covered that quite a bit, so I don't want to spend too much time today because we have a lot more to cover. But let me just... Um, let me just try to sum that up real quick. So he said, you missed the first trigger. What do you do about the second trigger? Let's go back to like that. Uh, I think Shay's also in the service. I think he might be asking about like kite or something. Let's see. Um, let's say you have an entry here. If the stock pulls back below it, then you have a sec you take a second entry above that level. Okay. Now, if you miss the entry, and it's a week or two later. You want to wait for another setup. So as long as a stock is set up, you want to take that second entry. Okay. For instance, let's say let's say your entry is here. A stock well, let's say it hits it and it comes back in. And that's a little bit extreme. Let me see if I could make a better example than that. Oops, I lost everything. Good question stacking up, by the way. Okay. Um, Let's say you have an entry here, and the stock rallies up, hits the entry, and then comes back in. Well, if this stock is still set up as like a trade pivot pullback, then your new entry would be above that high. Okay, So you want it to not only re-trigger by hitting your entry, but you also want it to hit the, take out a new high that's been set in the stock since that entry. Okay, Now, let's say the stock goes on to do this, then you avoid the stock altogether. Now, let's say it trades sideways for a while to a point where it's no longer set up. You would no longer take the setup. Even if it does begin to rally up, you just let it go. Now, if it pulls back, it starts looking good, and this would be this would be a setup that you're taking it of itself. And if you're in a trading service, which you are, I would actually point this out as, hey, potential for an add-on trade. I wouldn't actually recommend it as an add-on trade, but I'd point it out. So anything... That would be a new setup within that stock. If you missed it, would be a new chance for you to get in. Okay, but let's say you miss it, and a week or two goes by, then just let it go, forget about it. Okay, we're not going to try to buy somewhere down here and beat the system because the entry was there. There's two different things. You look for perfection going into a position. Okay. But if you miss the position and it's not set up and there's no place to really get in logically because it's not set up again, then you let it go. You just missed it. it it's life. Guess what? You're going to miss a few, but you're going to get better and better at catching more and more winners with time. But you have to be willing to let a few of them get by. Okay. So you're not trying to buy the, beat the system. Let's say it starts dropping like a stone. Okay. Well, this thing triggered back here. I'm going to try to buy it here, and I'm going to save five bucks. Okay. On a trade, well, no, that's a bad idea because it's going the wrong way. Or even buying in the base is, is, is a bad idea, okay? But, Dave, what about the dead money thing? Well, the dead money thing is you look for perfection going into the trade. You have a setup. You take the trade. You stick with the trade, in for a penny, in for a pound. Honor your stops. If stopped out, stopped out. If not stopped out, stick with the position. But if you miss a trade and it's two or three weeks in, don't. Take the trade now because that market has lost momentum. But, Dave, you said dead money. No. Once you're in a position, you let it play out. 
Because if you get into a position and then change your mind or if you get out because it's basic or whatever, I guarantee you that position is going to take off without you. And you're micromanaging is going to, you're going to micromanage yourself out of all of your winners and never have a winner. Now, if you miss a trade, that's a different thing. It's two different things completely, two different mentalities altogether. If you miss a trade, you wait for it to re-trigger or you wait for a new setup within that particular stock. That's the rule. You have to have rules to follow. Those are the rules for the missed trade, and then the rules I just gave prior to that are the rules for the taken trades. Okay? You look for perfection going into a market. Once you're in the market, you have to realize that you're not necessarily going to get that perfection. Okay? Obviously, you're not going to get it. Because if you did, you'd own the world. You would have the Holy Grail or whatever you want to call it. Most overused term in trading, I know, but it makes so much sense. Okay? More shares required for smaller intraday moves versus smaller share size for swing trades. I find it much easier to control risk with less size. More shares required for smaller intraday moves. Well, if you're – keep in mind if you're trading intraday and you're putting on a lot of shares, don't kid yourself that you don't have risk on a line, okay? What if, God forbid – some sort of terrorist attack occurs or something. And you just put on a bunch of shares in a day trade. Or something happens. I don't know. Maybe it's a snowstorm. Maybe a power outage. Maybe something happens. Less, uh, maybe not so ominous as a terror attack or whatever. But something bad happens that closes that exchange or halts that exchange or whatever. Well, that stock that you decided that, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy... 20,000 shares to make the math right, you know, that stock might open up 10 points lower. Or you could have an individual company event, okay? Some news could come out, something stupid, like the CEO having an impropriety or something, whatever. <laughs> and that stock could be halted intraday. So don't kid yourself in thinking that you have less risk day trading. The problem is if you ever get clocked, in a day trade, it's going to take you a long, 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 long time to recruit. But Dave, can't you get clock swing trading and then position trading? Absolutely. And you will get clocked sooner or later. But you might be able to trade out of it through damage control or at least mitigate some of the damage. Or even if you do get whacked, so what? Your position size is small enough to where you can live to fight another day. And uh, you position yourself for unlimited gains. See, your day trade is limited to how much that stock can move in one day. Okay? So at least in present day, not maybe, maybe 20 years ago, but uh, at least in present day, you're not going to get a move from 40 bucks a share to 80 bucks a share, round numbers like this, intraday okay so let's say we do come in tomorrow and get whacked let's say 20 bucks on this one all right 20 buck haircut overnight so what we made 40 bucks we lost 20 bucks we still made 20 bucks plus we took some additional profits along the way the money management works out not that you won't get whacked and lose actual more money than your principal okay but or open profits i should say but it can happen but as long as you position yourself for an open-ended trade like this you're making money, which might pay for several of those spankings, which could occur. Okay? I agree much less size required for swing trading. Yes. It's not an advantage of trading ETFs rather than individual stocks. That stocks is that you are subject to overnight large gaps, which move out of your favor. Some of these can be very, very negative gaps. Right, Fred, but some of those, some of those gaps can be very very profitable and what's my what's my mantra that I'm that I'm always saying one of the things I'm always saying surprises usually happen in the direction of the trend so we've been short stocks before and have them haircut 50 percent overnight doesn't happen every day but it does happen so yeah there's less risk with your ETF 
but with, with less risk comes less reward, okay? You're not going to get a move like this at an ETF. Well, it depends on the ETF, but most ETFs aren't going to make a move like that, okay? Yeah, it could go both ways, and, and that's true. So you're right, uh, but you're, it's going to be harder to make a lot of money at ETFs, but they are a little bit, a little bit less risky, you know, provided now something stupid. What if, um, I mean, you know, you, you still could have whoever's running the ETF do something stupid. I mean, let's not get into that, but you could have some sort of market default on them or something that could happen. Terrorists like Swiss National Bank last night. Oh, okay. I was not aware of that. Why do we not make more than liberal made? Obviously, this would be proportional ones capital. Why do we not make? Why do we not make the money Livermore made? Obviously, this would be proportional ones capital. Well, Livermore might have been in the right place at the right time, um, but you don't want to take anything away from those people. I mean, I know some people, and I don't want to point out any names because because it's going to sound like I'm taking away from what they did, but. Um, some of your market wizard types, so to speak, were in the right place at the right time. And they'll tell you flat out, yeah, I made $80 million doing this, but could I do that again today? No. That, that Those markets were absolutely wonderful for that particular thing. But guess what? They were in the right place at the right time. They had the knowledge. So you're spending time here with me. So hopefully we get another 1999 come along. What are we going to do? We're going to print some money. And we're going to print money in a big way. By the way, what's been going on with IPOs? We had a bull market there. I recognize that. I told you that. Okay? Or you recognize that too, maybe. So what do we be doing? We trade some IPOs. We make it some money. So we're learning, and through learning, maybe we'll be in the right place in the right time when that market condition comes along. Okay? Yeah, Livermore blew up multiple times. Um. But he seemed to learn a little bit every time he did. And then he eventually put a bull in his head, and I think he died broke. So it's not how he ended up. <laughs> it's not how he ended up that's important. It's, it's what he did in the interim. And, and every time he blew up, I think he knew what he was doing wrong, and he'd go back in and do the right thing for a while until he did the wrong thing. Uh, yeah, he used to pawn his wife, Jules, um, from what I understand. And go out and trade. Read, read. Uh, I got it right here. Let me see if I could get the name for you. It's on my website. If if you can't find it, in fact, I could just poke around and find it. Uh, read his life story. Yeah, he suffered from untreated depression. True. Okay, not because he was broke. Very good, Martin. Um, somebody recently wrote that he he died broke. I'm not sure about that. He had a lot of money. Uh, back when. Back then, let's see. Yeah, he had a he had a bad depression. The Swiss bank stopped pegging the Swiss uh, franc to the euro, and it soared twenty five percent in minutes. That was what the terrorist crack was all about. Swiss trade, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, something could back could happen in an efficient market. Okay, there's a great example. They unpegged the Swiss franc to the euro. What happened? Boom! It goes crazy. Okay, so now you've got a huge move in an inefficient market. I'm sorry, efficient market, and you're probably leveraged to the gills. And if you're on the wrong side of that, you get in trouble. Scott Smith left. Uh, don't uh, Scott asked a question? Can, should I, can I substitute stuff for HV? No, use HV. HV works. There's no there's no sense to reinvent the wheel. Okay. Um, I got a question. That's let's uh, go ahead and get out to the markets here. Somebody's asking me as it relates to. I mentioned GDXJ. In fact, um, let's go ahead and open it up on individual stock issues while I talk about the market. Um, oops. Let's fix this. Okay. Great questions today. Great bunch today, FYI. I was a little nervous. I didn't see any questions coming in, and then, bam. Oh, let me um, 
let me finish the slides real quick. Oh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, I've been talking about IPOs quite a bit because I'm on fire for IPOs. They've been on fire all last year and so far this year. They're doing great. Uh, with the course, I offer unlimited lifetime support. So if you see a stock like this Trillium, T-R-I-L, I think, or I forget the symbol on this, and you say, Dave, is that a buy a B? I will tell you it's a buy a B, okay? So that's what I mean by lifetime support. Now, I'm not going to keep that. It's unlimited within reason, okay? We can't talk two hours a day. It's not enough time there. But as far as it relates to the course, as far as it relates to IPOs, if you ever had a question about IPO, please let me know. The other thing, too, this has been popular, so let me just point it out real quick, and then we'll hop into the charts. Uh, if you get the stock selection course, I'm, right now I'm giving one year trading service free. Uh, I keep threatening to take this away, and I think I will eventually, but for now, you get a whole year of the service free, so that's like um, it's like half off uh, the whole entire package. So you're saving at least this amount of money on that. So FYI. All right, let's hop out to the charts, and then I want to show you. Uh, we want to take a look at that. Let me look at that GDXJ real quick, and then I'll we'll look out the um, take a look at everything else. Looks like I'm doing pretty good without my Mountain Dew today. <laughs> I do miss it though. I'm gonna go to black. I like a black chart better. I like drawing on a white chart, but I work on a black chart. Um, question with GDXJ is, um, well, let me show you what I'm seeing first. Uh, it's got you got a bow tie here. So it'd be triggering right around now. Uh, you probably want to maybe use a little bit more liberal entry on that. And a question on that is GDX needs to break over 30 and then pull back before you recommend it. Not exactly. Okay. Are you tactically recommended it here? Yes. If so, can you explain? Okay. Keep in mind with these transitional patterns like a bow tie or a first thrust or something, you're not necessarily going to get that nice reversion to the mean move. Okay you're not going to get this nice little pullback. So you're entering, sometimes you're entering almost more like a breakout trader than a pullback trader. So that's why, I mean, technically it's triggered right now. Uh, but, yeah, get a little bit more room, and you will be kind of closer to that 30 on that. So that's a good uh, good question on that, Robert. Robert's pretty smart. He's on the service. <laughs> Do you feel that there will be a lot of setups and mid-caps coming due to drop of gasoline prices? I don't know. I'll know when I see it. Um, but if the big cap stocks are going to have to have a volatility in which I want to trade, okay. Now, by the way, we talked about HV. Notice the HV and the GDXJ is ridiculous. It's 86, okay. That's an ETF. So these are very volatile stocks put together, but they're so volatile, the overall market itself is still HV of 86. Let's take a look uh, at the um, – Overall market, I want to show you a few things here. First of all, let's take a look at the P's. Uh, P score is a bit of a bummer. Uh, officially, I think we now have a bow tie down after all-time highs, as I just said a minute ago. In an inefficient market like an index, a forex or commodity, a bow tie or an emerging trend pattern off of all-time highs or all-time lows can be the significant start of a new trend, and you can have an inefficient move. Now, we did have one inefficient move back here, as you can see, and I thought this was going to be the mother of all tops back here, okay? See your bow tie here? But the market only dropped about 8 or 9%. Only? Well, that's a significant drop. So... It pays to pay attention. But right now we've got another bow tie setting up off a bit of a minor double top. So that's a little bit concerning. Now, a few big updates to make all the difference in the world. And this is why we like to wait for our signals as opposed to anticipating them. Let's take a look at the NASQAQ. Uh, down towards the bottom of its range, not the end of the world yet. Okay. So let's wait and see what's going to happen here before getting too excited one way or the other. But you can see it is approaching the bottom of its range. Hopefully, you could use the word hope, but hopefully that range will hold. Let's see, is that a 200 moving average? Yeah. Let's take a look at the P's real quick. 
Yeah, this is the beauty. This is um, pay attention. I'll show you something here. Um, I used to joke when I worked with another trader. Um, the joke about the thermos. He keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold, as the Cajuns say. In Cajun joke, it's like um, how do it know? Well, one thing the how do it know when it comes to markets is one thing that's pretty amazing is you a lot of technicals come together at the same points. So and notice that the low in the S and P 500 is almost exactly where the 200-day moving average is. And I think I talked about this a while back. I said when or if we get to 1975 the 200-day moving average will be there. So hopefully, you hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll find a little support around 1975, which is the bottom of the range. So I don't see any reason to get too excited just yet. There are some things that have started to really concern me, though. So we're going to take it one day at a time, one setup at a time, and let things unfold. If this thing goes on to make new highs, then I'll say, well, you see, I told you this is why we don't get too bearish until we actually have the signal in place. Okay. Uh, NASDAQ a little wide and loose in here sideways. Looks like it wants to come down and test the bottom of its range. The 200-day moving average obviously a little further away in that particular case. Let's take a look at the Rusty. And you can see the bottom of its range is where? Right around the 200-day moving average. So about 114 in the IWM. Looks like a pretty good place for support for the Rusty. Rusty's a bit of a bummer because we haven't made any forward progress in about a year. Okay. Uh, if you are trading more volatile stocks like we do, um, then maybe the Rusty is a better uh, benchmark, so to speak. I like the way Greg talked. Greg Morris talked in his book about benchmarks and all. It's like you don't don't worry about a benchmark. Just just do the best you can, okay? And then um, within the markets that you trade, a lot of these big cap areas, insurance. Um, conglomerates, durables, non-durables, okay, they're all kind of looking a little toppy in here. You want to call them head and shoulder tops, that's fine, whatever you want to call them, but they're all looking a little dubious. So that's a little bit concerning. Now, what's really concerning is to take a look at the banks and back your chart way out, and you can see the banks are breaking down from this big, wide and loose range in here. So that's not a good thing, obviously. There. Um, metals and mining have been banging out new lows in here today, notwithstanding. Uh, steel and copper, we're hitting new lows yesterday. They're bouncing a little bit today. By the way, you know, it's like, uh, oh, look, let's, let's, buy some, let's buy some copper because the market's low. Well, what happens? Bam. It goes even lower, right? That's why, we're not, that's why we don't bottom fish. Now, take a look at gold and silver. And you can see that gold's kind of bottomed out in here. It's rallied up. It's pulled back a little bit, kind of cup and handle looking. Let's take a look at the bow ties. You can see it's made a bow tie up off of multi-year lows. Okay, let's take a look at a weekly chart. Okay, it's lowest level since 2009. So that's a pretty significant low. Anyone who was short from up here on down, okay, is going to be on the wrong side of the market pretty soon as this market begins to go higher. So far, so good in gold. Ditto for silver. Somebody a couple of weeks ago, very, uh, uh, what's the word, astute, or very smartly said, hey, Dave, is that a head and shoulders bottom? And I said, yes, but I don't care. I need some sort of signal for me to get excited. Well, guess what? Now we got a signal. Market um, didn't do a bow tie off those lows, but it's bow tied up now since those lows. And then it's broken out and pulled back a little bit, so it's kind of got a first thrust look to it. So, yeah, silver looks like it's bottomed to in here. On the good side, another market's on the good side, I should say, drugs and biotech kind of hanging in there. They've been doing especially well on a relative strength basis. So, so far, so good. Maybe today notwithstanding, down a little bit today. But kind of hanging in there at high levels, so that's a good thing on those particular stocks. So I would strongly recommend you honor your uh, – Stops on existing positions, just in case this thing uh, gets a little uglier. Okay. Okay, let's hope, let's uh, look at individual issues. MIFI. MIFI. Don't know it. I don't think. MIFI. Oh, MIFI. Uh, this looks kind of interesting here. Let's take a look at this. Uh, my only concern is this little run here is a little bit extreme. You've heard me talk before about what I call a bottle rocket. Um, 
in this particular case, it's kind of shot higher. I don't know. It's a little bit too extreme move, but I hear you, and I see what you're saying. It's taken off and pulled back, so it does still look like it has potential, but the only problem is it's kind of made such a big move already, okay? CDE for James. That's going to be a gold stock. Um, it looks okay. Uh, it looks okay. I think you might be able to find something a little bit better in the gold and silvers, but I hear you. It looks like it's turned a corner. It does have some overhead supply. I'm going to give that an okay, but maybe dig a little further, no pun intended, and see what else you can find. SLW for Gary. Uh, yeah, it's breaking out. It's not really set up, but I hear you. It's going to have to keep breaking out. But it's certainly bottoming out. It's a little wide and loose. Silver socks are going to be a little wide and loose. Um, you know, the GDXJ is, is actually kind of cleaner stock within most of these uh, gold and silvers. GDXJs would be the junior gold miners. But you can see you've kind of got a nice bow tie working there. So far, so good. Blue. Blue is going up too much. Blue is in my momentum list. But when you have a big gap like this, it's just... His stocks are hard to trade after that, so I see it's getting whacked a little bit. Maybe it'll come out uh, today. <clears throat> but, yeah, it's, uh, they tend to just – notice how it went straight up and then now just kind of drifted higher. And yeah, I know it's 20 points, but just kind of drifted. So I would leave that one alone, and it'll probably come out of my, my momentum list today. DHT, the reason I put it in was right here. You can see it made a new high on expansion to range. Not that I trade like that personally, but as far as momentum list tracking – when I see a new high on expansion and range, it, it almost automatically goes into my list. DHT for, for John, HT. Yeah, this looks pretty good. I'm not a big fan of the shippers. Uh, shipping stocks tend to just chop around a lot. But I hear you. It looks pretty good. Uh, pretty good run higher. And then also, notice that it went up and then it accelerated higher. So I'm going to, I guess I'll give you a high five on that one. That's pretty good. Okay, certainly a, a not bad. AU for John, you guys are digging around the gold stock still, I could tell. Yeah, AU looks fantastic, um, except that it's already triggered. Okay, you got the bow tie in here, and then today it's triggering. It's triggering as we speak, uh, or just already triggered, I should say. Uh, could run into little problems around 14 or 15 or so, but I guess that's a good problem to have. Shea says, what are the MG symbols? These are, um, they used to be Media General. What are they now? Um, Morningstar Industry Groups. If you go to, uh, Morningstar is a company that tracks things, mutual funds and stuff. And these are like, these are like, let's say gold. If you want to see what's within that, these are going to be all the gold stocks within this industry. So like, I just changed over to gold. You can see. So, and then somewhere in here, here's the index. MG135 is gold. Media General 135, or used to be Media General. Now it's Morningstar. Okay. LSG, Lakeshore Gold within that. What's the best gold symbol trade? GLD, I guess. Uh, what's the Canadian gold thing? Uh, a buddy of mine's, um, what's the Canadian gold trust? CCJ, CC, anybody remember what that is? I asked a buddy of mine to take me there, and he said, not in a million years. They actually had the physical, largest physical, allegedly, um, stockhouse of Golden World. When they moved the gold around, it's like James Bond movies. I said, hey, could you spin me around a dozen times, put a blindfold on my head, drive me around the desert, and then take me to a gold vault, a gold vault and show me the gold? And he said, David, not in a million years. So... So much for that. Anybody? What's the CEF Central Fund? Yeah, CEF. Take a look at CEF too. You know, the, it's legit. Well, wait a minute. I don't want to get in trouble saying that. <laughs> I'm not allowed to give direct advice. So uh, I know one of the founders, and he's a nice guy. So I'm guessing that it's on the up and up. But yeah, they have they have some of the largest gold store. I mean, it's James Bond, man. They'll take off with like five or six. Uh, 
we call them 18 wheelers and then they'll each one will go off in a different direction and one of them will actually have the gold and it's crazy stuff crazy crazy stuff OCUL Yeah, this one looks okay, but it's, it's sort of like it uh, It had like a knockout move. It's a little on the, it's way on the thin side. This has caught my eye quite a bit on this knockout move. But notice it just kind of rallied up in here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It still looks okay, but it's getting to be a few many days, and it's also super, super, super thin. So as a private trader, you could do it, but just be careful. Long spin off TB, PH, bow tie off all time low. Looks like trans. Positioning to an uptrend TB, PH. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Absolutely. Um, we've got some bad data in here. But, yeah, this looks good. This is good. This caught my eye recently or this morning when I was doing my uh, my homework for the show. Uh, absolutely. It looks fantastic. High five. I mean, this thing is bottomed out. It's got a bit of a Phoenix characteristic because it's fell, fallen from grace. Absolutely. Who said that? Howard. Howard's not on the service. See, well, we've got one guy on the service that's smart. It's not on the service. F O M X. Yeah, I like this one too. This is another one that kind of has fallen from grace. It's a little bit on the thin side. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the, the Phoenix strategy with the IPOs, and I think that I've come to the conclusion that it is a good strategy. And yeah, this F O M X is, is on my personal watch list. Uh, it's not on the service because it's a little bit on the thin side. Oh yeah, absolutely. He's asking for a second entry. I, I wouldn't even call it triggered yet. Yeah, I would enter somewhere in here, maybe. Good eye on that. Martin wants to talk about GG. GG looks pretty good. It looks like it's already triggered here today. All these goals are triggered nicely today. Astute, even if you don't care. ADXS, ADXS. Yeah, I mean, this would maybe it'll pull back, but it's already ran up about 400%, Heather. So the problem here is uh, how much more does it have to go? Uh, so I'd be careful with that one. It could be a little dangerous. I mean, you know, maybe back here it was only up 200%, but now it's it's up 400% or so. It's a little too dangerous. Some are watching 150-day moving average, the 30 weeks launch just the Weinstein. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, whatever you want to watch. <clears throat> C-U-T-R. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. I want to pull back. It's kind of thin, though, Heather. Be careful, because uh, only 30,000 shares, and it's an established issue. Uh, you know, But, Dave, these new issues, sometimes you trade some stupid thin ones. Yeah, but it's a little bit different, because new volume is coming into the market with those type of issues, whereas an established stock like this, yeah, it's a little bit more dangerous to trade. Maybe on a pullback, but the volume is ridiculously low on that. Okay. Tummy, is this pullback too long? Too many days. T U M I. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. Yeah, it's on the cusp of being too long. So if this doesn't trigger suit, plus it's kind of back to chart out again a little bit. And it's got a uh electrocardiogram look to it. So yeah, I would I would avoid that. Target Canada just declared bankruptcy TGT rallies. Oh, I don't, I don't know. You confuse an issue with facts. Who cares? You know, stop watching the news. Your life's gonna get a lot easier. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is just the stuff that I trade there. It's just kind of took off and then it died out. Watch the stock selection course. What do I preach? This followed by this. This good. This bad. Okay. You never want to get into a market that's losing momentum. Oh, John, you're so nice. <laughs> John's not, I swear, John's not a shill. John says, for those who have not bought the IPO course, please believe me, it's excellent money well spent. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. And uh, anyone who does, like, if you buy a course from me and I redo the course, because maybe later this year we'll, um, I'll do another course on IPOs, you can come back free anytime you want, okay? KGC. Um, I think you could do better in the golds uh, than this. I hear you, though. It's kind of bottomed out. But look at the mountain of overhead supply and overhead resistance. I mean, that's one of the problems with these low-level stocks is you are going to run into some of that overhead resistance on their way back up.
Did we look at this one already? Yeah, we did. It's overextended. KGC, King's Cross, KGC, KGC. Uh, yeah, we looked at that one. I think you can find better in the golds. IMKTA. How big a pullback? Check out the weak hands. Uh, this is a nice, nice, nice. Uh, it's thin, though. Boy, it's super thin. Heather, you're, you're kind of skirting around these thin issues. Be careful. Um, how much knockout to knock out the shares? Oh, I don't know. Let's say three or four points at least based on the volatility of the stock. It's got an HE of 30, which isn't that high. Keep in mind that that persistency, notice the stock is going up day after day, will drive down that. But, yeah, absolutely good eye, uh, just super thin. But maybe no, knockout down to 40. So let's say four or five points would be a good knockout move for that particular stock. Good eye, though. BLCM, pullback too severe. BLCM, BLCM. Uh, no, no, because this is an IPO, okay? And it's run up fairly well in here. No, absolutely not. This is, I'll give you a high five. That looks pretty darn good. Um, I, I would prefer if the run would have been a little bit bigger in here, but it's still a pretty, it's still a 60% run from the lows. Uh, yeah, absolutely. High five on that. That's a good look. That's, that's what I call a first pullback in an IPO. And that's a good, uh, trade. Minimum amount of shares, okay, if it's 500 or more, 500,000 or more, that's a good number to go off with. Less than 500,000, you're okay. You want at least a couple hundred thousand on average. Now, an IPO, you don't have that luxury, so as long as you have a few days in here where you're seeing some decent volume. See, there's 800,000 shares. There's a, hundred, there's a million and change is a half a million, uh, 300, 300, 500. So, even though you don't have a tremendous amount of volume in here, as long as if it's an IPO, as long as you have a few days where you're getting some of that uh, six-digit volume, it's okay to trade them because a lot of times more volume will flow into the market. Okay, but yeah, here's the thing: you know, there's always a trade for trading. And sometimes you get into these IPOs, and it's happened to me too, where you get in and then the volume dries up. It, you know, it's, it was low volume to begin with, and volume actually decreased. But sometimes you hit it just right on something like this one here. And then you get into it and that volume flows in and all of a sudden it makes that huge inefficient type of move. But yeah, I mean this is we should end on this one because this is a end on a high note. That's a good looking uh trade. In fact, let's do that. Uh I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um as you can tell, I love doing these shows. Uh we looks like we ran out of time before we got to everyone. Uh, I'll I'll allow a little bit more time next week to make sure. And anything unanswered, you could send me an email at davidavelandry.com. Again, I love these shows. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm humbled for you to be here. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, Malta Grazia. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, if we don't talk this uh, between uh, now and the weekend, everybody have a great weekend. And then I uh, hope to see all you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much.